two colleagues coming from the University of Göttingen, namely Sumit Maskar and uh, Rajendran Ayaturai, and who give two short presentations I heard about five minutes or so. And so we will have some longer time to discuss about Dalits, the situation of Dalits in current India. I think this is enough. I think everybody knows Dr. Ambedkar, uh, these blue books, which everybody of sh us should have read. I know Noah is also studying these books. I have been studying them some time ago. And uh, we are happy to have that exhibition in Magdeburg right now and learn some more things about it. Okay, who will start? Super, I'll start. Okay. First of all, I would like to thank Saili, Nora, and Anurag for taking this initiative. And we were actually quite uh, pleasantly yeah. surprised. Yeah. This is amazing. So, uh, first, yeah. we would like to really congratulate for successfully organizing this exhibition. And we were really pleased to receive the emails. And you have done a great exhibition as well, and you have added more pictures. And I look forward to going down and seeing it again. So, yeah, as Professor has just mentioned that we will speak for 10 minutes each roughly. So what I am going to do is just going to briefly highlight what caste means and what it is contemporary relevance is. And then we can come to the discussion. So first, why do we really have to talk about caste? The simple point is because it continues to influence the life chances of individuals across South Asia. And by South Asia, we mean India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Myanmar, Sri Lanka. So all these regions, people uh, are affected by the social institution called caste. And when we talk about these regions, then there is another layer, which is religions. So usually it's commonly understood that caste is, um, so only Hinduism has caste and it is affected. But what we have seen gradual transformation is that all other religions that came to India or those who were, uh, you know, grown in India, they also adopted the caste system. So you have Dalit Christians, you have upper caste Christians, you have upper caste Muslims, you have lower caste Muslims, and same with Sikhism. So each and every religion adopted this particular, what we know as the Brahminical caste system. And they have adopted in more or less similar ways. So we are not going to talk in detail about each religion and how it adopted, but just to say in brief that at some point in history, each and every religion adopted this particular caste structures, so that in pretty much each and every religion, you have people who belong to different castes. Okay, so now that's part as far as within religion is concerned. Now what happens when people from South Asia migrate to the West? Say Europe, say America, Canada, wherever. And what has we have found is that people carry the social attitudes with them. Not just social attitudes, but also social practices. And one of the examples that I can give is the Vienna shooting. So there was uh, an incident of firing incident in a Sikh temple, Gurudwara, in Vienna. So that involved a caste conflict within the Sikhs. So one Manjat Sikhs and one uh, the lower caste Sikhs. So the other example I would like to give is the United Kingdom. So in, in the United Kingdom, during the last 10 years, they wanted to introduce a bill which is named as Equality Bill and which will take into account race, racial discrimination, uh, discrimination on the basis of language, gender, sexual orientation. So what happened in the United Kingdom 10 years ago roughly is that the, those Dalits who have settled in the United Kingdom, they demanded that caste should also be included as part of the Equality Bill. But not very surprisingly, the upper caste Hindus who are based in the United Kingdom strongly opposed that bill, uh, the inclusion of caste in that bill, on the grounds that caste doesn't exist in the United Kingdom. Anyway, that's the debate that will go on forever, whether caste exists or not. And so it is now up to the, the British Parliament, and they have appointed several committees to decide whether caste exists or in what form. So now that we have talked about caste, I mean, I really hope we can see some this little graph that I have created. So this is just to give you an idea what actually uh, caste is. And so this is going to be a very brief description. And to say anything about caste in five minutes is going to be not doing justice to the subject. But nonetheless, given the time we have allo been allocated, let's start here. So the, the 
the word caste has its origin in the Portuguese word casta. That's the basic. And then when we talk about the English word caste, it has two meanings. One is varna and the second is jati. So as you can see from the left hand side, this little five blocks. So this A, B, C, and A, B, C, D, and E. So these blocks are known as varnas. Just simple. And within each block, you can see that A1, A2, A3, B1, B2. So these are jatis. So that's the absolute simplification as it can get. And as you can see at the top of, so this is a fourfold structure, and then the Dalits, the untouchables, are added to this particular uh, structure later. We can again come back to the discussion. So what happens is you have Brahmins who are the priestly caste who also control education and knowledge. They are at the top of the caste hierarchy. Then you have the warrior caste, the Kshatriyas. Then you have the Vaishyas, the trading castes. Then you have the Shudras, uh, the one who are supposed to serve the caste which are above them, the three. And these are also now grouped as other backward castes for uh, quota or affirmative action and uh, in jobs and education <coughs> and in the parliament for the political representation. And below that you have the untouchables. But what happens, what, if you see that there is something which I call as pollution line. So above, above the untouchables, these are all groups are known as touchables. So basically they can touch each other and nothing will happen to them. But what happens with the pollution line is that the moment some anybody from the four varnas touch the untouchable, that person becomes polluted. And now there is this ritualistic ceremony where they undergo purification process. But what it also means that whatever uh, job the untouchable does, that job becomes polluted. And therefore, so doing a leather work is a polluted, polluting work. So I'll come to the economic aspect, but this uh, is the broad structure of caste and the, the little arrow that you can see on the right hand side, the arrow that I have put here is just to signify that that system remained intact, number one, there is absolutely no change in the system and there are no, as Ambedkar said, there are no staircases to the system. You cannot change your caste the way you cannot move up or down. And the second and the, and, the, and the arrow I have created to suggest that there's the rights, the economic rights, the social rights, political rights, cultural rights that we talk in the modern day discourse, they go from top to the bottom. So Brahmins have the absolute rights in terms of each and every sphere. And as you go down the caste hierarchy, the, the number of rights each and individual has, it starts declining to the extent that when you go down to the Dalits or untouchables, the rights are absolutely minimal or negligible. And that rights uh, pertain to economy, politics and society. So in terms of economy, it will be jobs, occupations, what you do. Just So just a quick comparison for like a one minute. As you can see, in terms of, the so uh, this is a very crude description of class structure. But this is just in terms of economic description of like wealthy, rich, upper middle class, middle class, working class and poor. So the arrow that you go in both directions suggests that with all its problems, one can move upwards and downwards. And that's what suggests a fluidity in that society. And that's what we don't have fluidity here. The fluidity is, uh, uh, say for example, a Dalit can become a wealthy rich, but his or her social status will not change. And same with Brahmins. The Brahmin can be absolutely poor, but his or her social status will not change. And that's why it's an absolutely stagnant society in terms of social status. Of course, the economy changes, and in, with that, you will have class variations within each group. But the point itself is your social status doesn't change. So now only like five features. The first feature is, is it, uh, of the caste is, it is hereditary. <coughs> that it is passed on through generations, and it is non-changeable. You cannot change your caste if you want. Um, and second is it's occupation specific. Now the jatis that I mentioned, A1, A2, that particular jatis, so the occupation is attached to those particular jatis. Now this is all historical and I'm going to come absolutely in a minute in contemporary. And so as far as uh, marital relationship are concerned, it's endogamous. So you again marry within those particular jatis, B1, B2, or maximum within that varna, which is the block B, C, D. And then 
the the most important part is education because education is the tool for social and economic mobility and that historically was controlled by the brahmins and but more than control it was the exclusion of dalits uh, the other backward caste which is the shudras and women across castes so all women across castes the people on the fourth block and the dalits they were all historically excluded from undertaking education and not just undertaking education but there were also penalties if somebody was found to take education which could involve brutal physical violence on dalits or anyone who took education and i am now coming to the contemporary situation so all this what i have explained so far has been historical okay this is how caste worked this is how the division of rights were and this is what some people got more rights and some people got less rights but now we are in the modern situation now india is a independent republic it has uh, abolished untouchability officially you have laws against uh, crime on dalits and also tribals so you have uh, these two things and the third thing you have this quota or affirmative action in education in jobs and in parliament for political representation so now where do we stand in terms of caste and untouchability why do we still talk because even if the caste decides that this is your right this is your right why do still people follow it why don't people just say for example change occupations so these are the questions which naturally people uh, will come uh, to their mind but the point is this is where the social structures shape up the economy that they control for example uh, your uh, schools so let's start with education just three i'll take four examples and then i'll close the uh, my talk so first is let's say education so you have across uh, like throughout the history from the mid 19th century and up to the present maybe but throughout the history in terms of schooling education you have lots of cases uh, about discrimination in the schools where the dalit students were kept outside the classroom and they had to sometimes take education sitting nearly outside the classroom or they were facing discrimination inside the classroom Uh, as far as their marks giving their marks in the examinations so there are different variation various levels of discriminations that happened in the schools and the second level is the higher education <clears throat> and there is a massive student protest in last year that took place uh, particularly after uh, this uh, ambedkarite student called rohit vemula who committed suicide mm -hmm. and it sparked out massive student protest across the country and that brought to the not uh, notice of the mainstream media the kind of discrimination that takes place in the higher education institutes in india so that's one aspect so the point <coughs> i'm trying to you know stress here is that officially caste is abolished you can be punished for practicing caste discrimination but these things persist because those <coughs> who are sitting in say the you know controlling the power in police stations in schools in offices in doctors so you have various levels they bring in their caste prejudices and they continue to practice discrimination and continue to have the system some way or the other the other one is economic uh, as far as economy is concerned now technically one should be free to choose anything but the point is you are not allowed to just enter any occupation those who control those big occupations will not allow you to enter those occupations in a way and that's where the discrimination in the labor market comes so basically two people with absolutely similar qualifications can go to the interview but one person will just simply get discriminated because that person belong to one particular caste of that group and this is i mean the discrimination in general in the labor market is a universal phenomenon but the way it works in india caste is very important and a recent study has found <coughs> even muslims face a uh, uh, big time discrimination in the labor market and this discrimination i'm reporting is at the higher level of the economy in like the so called this it sector or even the banking and insurance uh, which are the pillars of indian economy on the global landscape um the fourth one i would like to mention is about the violence against dalit women now because of all these caste uh, changes that are taking place one of the ways that uh, you know dalits are taught to be put in place is violence against the community in general but also dalit women face the absolute brutal violence in terms of rape and also physical violence and the last point i would like to make is about the intercaste marriages so for example i explained in the previous slide 
that you have this fixed marriages within that particular jati within that within that particular block or within the, in the within the sub block but what happens now is that even if there are attempts to cross that caste boundary that can actually result in honor killing so both the person both the bride and groom uh, can be killed and if you look if you just google honor killing india pretty much every week there is one case reported on this particular issue yeah and i think i'll stop on that point and yes, thank you can i just um, work on this on my own or So, um, thanks again, guys, and it's <coughs> fantastic. We were really surprised uh, to receive this invitation, um, and you know, we didn't communicate to you on your own. You guys picked it up from uh, the internet, and then we never thought uh, what we did in cutting would really spread around in Germany, and of course, went around the world too. So thanks, Nora. Thanks, Sally, and Anurag, and other friends who've been part of this. Now, um, I just wanted to speak on critical modernity and best vernacular history of the margin. And so I'm going to just build on what Sumit said. You know the structure and how do we see it? What do I mean by critical modernity? I'll just go step by step. So modernity, the moment I utter the word, comes from the word modern. What does it mean? So the medieval came to an end with the word modern. That means 